Good morning. Good morning. We're going to kick off. We know that there are some folks still coming through, but we don't want to delay in starting. So if we could just get your attention for those who are kind of still outside there, they can they can come in. But Leanne's just got a passage of scripture just to help us get focused on God. And she'll pray for us and then Josh and the team will take us into worship. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well done to all of you that are sitting here in this weather. I know it's quite hard to get out of bed when, when there's rain. You have to leave your comfort zone and step out. Um, if there are new people here, welcome. We are so happy to have you with us. And we do have forms at the back of the church, across there in the basket. If you are happy to leave your details with us, we'd love to connect with you. And after the service, we have tea and coffee. I just want to encourage everybody, if you knew or old, um, to, to join us. It's, it's still part of our, our time together. It builds connection and fellowship. And if you are someone who's here regularly, can I ask you to pivot means like open the circle let other people join in with you it's very hard for new people to be standing alone and not knowing anyone so let's be hospitable and welcome people into our our circles um i don't know if many of you have heard the saying wherever you are be all there yes Sorry, no, no. wherever you are be all there jb elliott apparently says that um, and I know a lot of the time we use that, like if somebody's immigrating or moving house or moving province, country, you know, you tend to not focus on where you are anymore and you've got no time for where you are. And your head and your heart are somewhere else. And I just wanted to encourage us that wherever you are, whether you're in South Africa, Johannesburg, your workplace, a relationship, wherever you are, we add value to that place, be fruitful in that place. God will move when the time is right. I think a lot of the time our, we're physically present, but our heads and our hearts are somewhere else. And then we don't add value and be fruitful in that place. So this morning, as we go into worship, let's come with our full selves. We're physically here, but let's have our heads and our hearts engaged to worship the Lord. Amen. And I just want to read the scripture from Psalm 100. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So as we enter worship now, let's focus our minds. Let's not be distracted about where else we want to be or what's happening later. And let's worship with, with the heart. Yeah. Will you stand with us? Father, we come into your presence. We come before you boldly with great confidence. Know that you're a God who speaks. You, you, you're the lifter of our heads. You, you fill our souls with great delights. We just pray, Father, that you, Holy Spirit, would put on us and, and just strengthen us in our inner being as Paul prays. In Jesus' name. Amen.
can stop the war, oh my Who can stop the war, oh my Who can stop the war, oh my Who can stop the war? So saying, Jesus is Lord, they were actually condemning themselves. Oh. The, the thing, and one day we know that every knee will come and bow before me, every knee will bow. But you and I today have the opportunity standing here to actually make that bow early, to say we do it of our own volition, to say that we are the ones, and with those words, with our tongues, with our testimony by the blood of the Lamb, by the power of the testimony, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, that we are safe, and I can't remember which one it was, I think it could have been James, one of the guys where they would not confess that Caesar was Lord and they were walking, and the captain, a Roman guy coming along, he actually ended up converting, and when the man came forward to actually have his head chopped off, this uh, Roman captain came along, had his head chopped off, just because of the testimony, there was something about that. Um, so let's just, as we go forward, if we can just pray that every knee will bow, but guys, it's actually we bow in our hearts. Um, we don't have to cross the sea to find testimony as something this. We just got to bow the knee to the ground. That's the shortest distance to salvation. It's from here to there. Um, so we can just do that with our hearts. Praise you, God. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Timmy. Thank you. Oh, 
hope, thank you, Jesus. You're not just a hope, but you're a living hope. You're alive. And forever will be. Not just some God in the distance, but a God who's here. Who hears every prayer. Knows the beginning and the end. Knows what's good for us. <coughs> Holds the universe in the palm of your hand. Yet it's so personal. And knows every intricate detail of our lives. We praise you. us see. Open the eyes of our hearts and open our ears that we may sense you among us. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We pray. Remove the barriers. Jesus makes himself real. We sang about a living hope. As he promised his disciples and his promise to you in my eyes, I will be with you. I'll be in you. This is, we're speaking about the Spirit of God. I just feel we just want to allow for the Spirit of God just to meet you with people this morning. But we're going to sing a song just which this is the cry of our hearts come Holy Spirit let that be the cry of your heart to know Jesus to encounter with God to taste the honey that is sweet not just to know about it but to taste it and see that the Lord is good that the eyes of hearts would be enlightened and open 
moment. That the ears of those who are struggling to hear Jesus would hear the still whispers of his voice. And those who are looking for inner strength would find a strength that they've never had before in their inner being. Such as the power and the dynamic of the Holy Spirit moving among us. So won't you just open your heart to the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of Jesus.
be foreign for some, but worry. We believe in a, in a God who, who sits on the throne, who engages with his people and does things that no man can do in the lives of his people. He meets needs that you don't even know that you need. And he, he deals with things in our lives in supernatural ways. We believe in a supernatural God that is not bound by the limitations of this world. He reigns above it all. And we're to have a faith that believes in that type of God that can bring about change where we see it as impossible. And so we need to create room and allow room for God to do things that He wants to do. And so He will highlight a few things. For God just would want to remove scales from us as he did with Paul. The Holy Spirit came upon Paul. Scales were removed from his eyes. He could see. He had better perspective. He could see the kingdom. He could see Jesus. Holy Spirit, just, if that's you, just Reach out to God in whatever way you, you want to. Whether it's bowing a knee, as Terry said earlier, or raising your hand. But, but just reach out to Him and say, God, open my eyes. That I may see the beauty of the kingdom the Bible proclaims. Father, I pray now that we would be 
a people that repent quickly. We'd be a people that forgive quickly. I pray that each person here, Lord, would just settle that and forgive or repent or whatever we need to do. So that our hearts may be softened to hear your voice and to see the beauty. But whilst we sing this last song, if there's those who, there's a passage of scripture in James that says we must be doers of God's word, not just listeners and hearers of it. It's no good just listening to it. We need to respond and do something. And, and then later on in the book of James, he says, if there's anybody among you that's sick or ill, lay, lay hands on them and anoint them with oil. It's just a simple passage of scripture. And so we just want to be obedient to God's word. We do in our time, in our meetings, to, to allow God to move. So we just want to take five minutes. And, and whilst we sing this song, Uncle Peter, I know you, you've got a struggling back and, and a leg that's hindered by that. I would love to, if you could just come up and we could pray for you. Uh, Peter's expected this morning. But if there's anybody else who just needs healing, breakthrough, uh, something to overcome, uh, we want to allow time and room for that. If I could just, if there are guys who do come up, please, Kieran, Brad, Dave, Alan, if you could all just come and help, just lay hands on people and pray for them. Um, we do have oil here, we're going to have to pass it around. It says, anoint them with oil, which is a representation of the Spirit of God, and lay your hands on them and pray for them. That's our job, the rest is God's job. Okay, so we trust in God, not in any man, but whilst we sing this, can we just... Pray for these folk. Um, if there's anybody who feels they would love to be prayed for, come on.
bitterness has been rooted out and forgiveness will flow that your very nature will be will be in them and they will feel a new strength and a new hope and a new faith and a new love when they leave this place not because of a preacher not because of a music or an instrument or anything like that but because of you jesus this is the god in whom we believe in jesus name amen, amen. Uh, i'm going to switch mics is that fine today. I, I think I have the gift of giving, but just not money. So I don't know how that works. <laughs> but anyway, no, I'm only kidding. So um, is this coming through? Clear enough? Anybody's birthday? Recently, this last week? Okay, there you go, Jono. John Rose, here's your birthday. Happy birthday. Mine is tomorrow. Okay, can, 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 yours is tomorrow. Can you, can, can I, can Russ, can you hand them out? John Rose's birthday. When was it, John? Mine's on Thursday. Yesterday. Okay. okay. <laughs> Liverpool are playing today, I believe, huh? Hey? Yeah, let's just hope that they get it right this time. Huh? Okay, who else's birthday? So it's John. Uh, Yours is on Thursday, come big. Hey, you go ahead to tomorrow. me. Tomorrow. And yours is tomorrow. Yes. Okay, well, because it's tomorrow, we'll give you one anyway. <laughs> I've just got to find the birthday one. Okay, if I can't find the birthday oh, there we go. There's another birthday one for you. So there's three birthdays and still. Oh, okay, that's an anniversary one. I can't give you a Be My Babe. That's JP's. <laughs> that's an anniversary one. Uh, Okay, here we go. Yes, you are awesome. How's that? There you go. Okay, Jackie. Uh, and Jackie, this is your birthday as well. Yo. Okay. Let's just see here. Lots of birthdays. Suddenly all the birthdays come out, eh? Yo. Uh, Jackie, you know what I give you? I give you besties, eh? Besties. You can be my bestie. Okay, come, you can come here, can somebody give that to Josh, can you go give that to Jackie there and wish him a happy birthday and give him a big hug? Bestie. Okay, tell him, tell him he's your bestie. Any anniversaries? Last week, this week, Alan, there we go, there you go. You can, there you go, be my babe, not my babe. I'll give it to Okay, so these are, we, we're the family, we like to celebrate the big moments in people's life. Oh, it's that? Oh, On Saturday. That's sure. Okay. 
Nice. And we've got some new folk here. Yeah. I know uh, it was Amy and June. Am I right? There we go. You guys get a break. You get a Kit Kat. Okay, great. Okay, good. That's Amy and June. Okay. Uh, Amy and June, there's going to be a little notepad at the back. We'd love to have your names and details. That's only if you want to. We promise not to bombard you with silly emails and stuff. But this will be at the back there, and you can just write your, your name in there. That would be great. And we can put that over there. Anybody else here new? Oh, no. <laughs> you just don't attend church that often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's all for today. Anybody else just want a chocolate for fun? <laughs> uh, this, Shanice, this was actually, this is for you. I did think of you when I bought this. And the reason is for all the, the, the stress on the back there on the AV. These AV ladies, I think they take the most stress in the life of the church. Yeah, <laughs> and obviously, Storm, but you've already got one. And if we gave you another one, that would just be favoritism. Okay. Just thought we'd have a bit of fun with that. Um, I'm going to uh, just play a video quickly. Um, I want you to see the sky. And it, uh, his name is Lifa. He leads a church in Lady Brand. And, and as we take up the offering, uh, when the offering goes around, I'll, I'll explain the context and how we've played a part in it. Okay? We exist for that which is bigger than ourselves. So if you could just play that video, that would be great. to be able to help them to find some water and then Pete West is the other voice that you hear there. He's a good friend of mine in Maseru Lesotho and uh, he kind of put together a package. But what we wanted to do was get him some, some water. And so here's a message that he sent uh, Pete to me. I am Tate Pete. I'd like to say thank you very much, showing big support for my family. It is my first time find grace and mercy from God. Find someone like your family concerning about my family needs. God bless you and your family more. I received a 2,000 rand gift from Keystone Church. Please send thanks to them. I would like to sincerely thank you for their generous gift to my family. We thank God for the grace he gives for them to give. Please send my love to the leader and the church at Keystone Emmanuel. So just so that you know, is... It was going to cost, I think, 8,000 rand to get a Jojo tank and get water from that mountain, which we can't, that was what the 2,000 rand was for. And there's a cost on the table of about 43,000 rand, which we want to help them get to get electricity to where they are. And these are very real practical needs to help them do what they need to do in that community. So we as a church, we, don't, we do exist to, to help one another, but we exist to help those beyond us. And I can't imagine how difficult it must be to lead people in, in that type of context and environment. But yet they've been faithfully doing it for, for 15 years. 
So if you do want to go above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings, you're welcome to come soon and say, I'd love to contribute to that particular cause. All right, so the solution that they're doing is a soda solution, which will help them with exactly where they are, but it won't just help them. There's a community in and around them that they gather with in order to be able to help. That water source will feed way more than just them. So, can we just pass around the baskets, please? Russell and Brad, if you could just take that around, that would be really great. Uh, you guys are the go-to guys. You want to sit in the front? <coughs> Can't get fat and lazy in this church. Okay. All right, just a couple of announcements. There's the bank details. We are operating out of one bank account now. Uh, bank account is operational, functional, working 100%. So, there are the bank details. If you want to give into the life of the church, um, just want to give that announcement. Dave Devonish is going to be with us on the 20th and 21st. He's going to be teaching into strongholds, spiritual gifts, spiritual warfare. It's going to be an incredible time here just to be able to host that. And I say host. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the link to that. Please register for it. It's no cost, but we do need to know numbers that are coming. There are people coming from other churches as well, and we do just need to know for catering purposes. It will be Saturday morning that he will be with us from about 9 until 1 o'clock on that day. What I do need, if you can put up that big word host, one of the things that occurred to me was uh, we need to be able to host people. You know, there's 12 people coming through from Bethlehem Church. Most of them are used and they can't afford a hotel here. Really, they can't. So I'm looking for people in our church to be able to host others. Many of them are young ladies, single ladies who are youths. And there's one or two couples. So please, if you want to be able to host, or you can open your home to host, I'm needing to host 12 people, all in all. And I would love us as a church not to have to go and pay for a hotel. I think that's just inhospitable. I think we as a people need to practice hospitality and open our homes. And it's only for one night. They're leaving very early on Saturday morning. They just need a place to stay on Saturday night. And then they will leave from here on Sunday morning after church. So please, if you can host, maybe you can meet somebody at the back. We'll get somebody a hostess. Tanya, you're chomping at the bit. Can you just take names of people from the back there? Yeah. Of people you want to host. Is that okay? Yeah. Great. Thank you. This is mine for a bunny chow later. <laughs> can I pray? Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you how it feeds us. We thank you for your provision, your abundant provision, how you provided manna from heaven. We thank you for the lives that we lead. We think of Lepha. We pray that you don't need our money. You can bless them however which way you choose, but you invite us to partner with you in your kingdom. And when we do, you multiply the resources. We need to find the faith to be able to open our hands and give. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, that as we share your word now, you would deposit faith in our hearts and see what a generous God you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to go with me, you can go to Mark 6. I'm going to read a passage of scripture of Jesus when he feeds the 5,000. I'm going to read from verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Notice it's a desolate place. I'll, I'll tell you the name of that place in a minute. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns. And they were so desperate to see him that they actually got there ahead of him. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when he grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages, so that they can buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, no, you, you give them something to eat. 
And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Just a quick question. We've, we've all heard of this story. Um, some of us might have read it. And, and even if you're with us for the first time, I'm, I'm sure you might have heard that Jesus fed 5,000 people at one time. Just a, a question I have for you. What do you think the atmosphere was like on that mountain? Uh, just, just quickly, what, what kind of vibe do you think it was? You know, Sunday afternoon, picnic, you know, live band going, maybe good atmosphere, kids kicking a board around, maybe, you know, a bit of badminton going on, sitting on blankets, you know, and I imagine those red and white checkered blankets, guys sitting down, Jesus there, everything's warm and fuzzy. Picnic top, bar. Would you imagine it to be like that? No. No. The atmosphere on this mountain was revolutionary. These 5,000 men weren't looking for a picnic. They, they were looking for a revolution, and they were looking for a revolutionary leader. And Jesus was their guy. They were not there to have a loafing around picnic. The reason was, and, and, and what Scripture indicates to us, is this region was a desolate place, but it was actually called the Hill District. And, and who hung out on the Hill District? Well, it was zealots, guerrilla fighters, um, freedom fighters, everybody that hated Rome. This was the hotbed of resistance to, to Rome in itself. This is what this district housed. And so you can imagine part of Jesus' crew is Simon the Zealot. You know, Simon the Zealot was one of Jesus' disciples. So he's probably connecting with lots of old friends there. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can imagine Matthew the tax collector feeling a little bit awkward because he had sold his soul to Rome. And so he's probably ducking and diving etc etc it's quite funny how jesus has these two types of characters in his core group isn't it he has a zealot and a tax collector who, who ordinarily would have hated each other i wonder when he sent out the pairs where he put those two together <coughs> just for a bit of fun so you know your differences but but this was the region that that he was in and, and do you notice at the end it said 5,000 men? Do you think it's perhaps because they, they didn't count the women and the children? Or do you think it was just because there were only men there looking for a revolution? In, in John 6 verse 15, on, on, on his account of this, it says these men were there to force him to be king. You know, they had got wind of what Jesus had done. Some of them possibly even seen, it, seen him in action. You know, maybe on Peter's lawn or Peter's mother-in-law's lawn where he healed everyone. They had heard about how he had calmed the storm on a way across to the other side, literally taking a hurricane and making it sit still like a young child. How he had cast out a legion of demons and taken a man that was totally hopeless and completely healed him of the demoniac. How he would have touched the leper and healed him completely from any kind of leprosy and restored him socially, emotionally, physically, just with one touch saying, I am willing. And, and the, the, at this particular point in Jesus' ministry, they say, this is our God. This is Him. This is the one we need to be a king to, 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 to start the uprising of a revolution so that we may be delivered out from the tyranny of Rome. This is our God. And, and this is just on the back end of John the Baptist being beheaded. 
one of their most favorite among them. So you can imagine there's emotions amongst these men. And, and, and if we read there, we see Jesus, he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. And automatically we think in Psalm 23, pick them. Sheep without a shepherd, it's nice and cozy. That phrase, sheep without a shepherd, whenever it's used in the Old Testament, is speaking about a military political leader. <coughs> Have we just lost batteries? see a back and change that quick. A military political leader. Not a shepherd as a warm and fuzzy shepherd. Because a Moses type, a Joshua type. One who was going to take them into a, an, an era where they could be the dominant force again. And, and that is the atmosphere. All those five points speak to the fact that this atmosphere is not a warm and fuzzy atmosphere. It's a militaristic type atmosphere. Atmosphere. It's a it's a revolutionary type atmosphere. And 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 Jesus sees them and he knows their intentions. That what they're wanting to make him to be, they want him to force him, and and he's not going to bow to their agenda. He does give them a revolution. He gives them a revolution, but not one that they wanted. One commentator put it this way, it is clear from this account that Jesus will not march to the popular, to popularist and militaristic drumbeat here in Mark 6. He disavows the zealot model of liberation, but he does not disavow a model of liberation. He's going to give them a revolution, but his revolution for us is way different to the revolutions that we see in the world and the way that revolutions come about and the way that people bring about their revolutions. His is vastly different. And what he does when they're expecting, he has this guy with great power going to lead us into a new era. They're expecting weapons and weapons training because this is going to be what we're going to do, we're going to fight it in the worldly way that we know. And Jesus, that's why verse 34 is so repudiating for them, so disturbing for them, because what Jesus doesn't do is, is bow to their drumbeat, but he starts to teach them in verse 34. And, and, and then he starts to do weighted training and food distribution training. He gives them words, and, and, and he takes his core people, the disciples, and teaches them how to distribute food. This is rather disappointing if you've come there to make him and force him to be your king. Why does Jesus do this? Well, he's starting to bring about the idea of what his revolution is truly about. The key is in the bread. He takes the bread and he starts to feed the people. But what did bread mean for them? And what does bread mean for you and I? Nowadays, if you have a loaf of bread, many people probably, two-thirds of the people won't even eat this loaf of bread because it's white bread. It's got no seeds in it. It's not gluten-free. You know, it's fattening, it's full of carbs. That's what bread means to us, just carbs. And there's so many other options. Who here eats good old-fashioned white bread? Okay, there we go. Nothing like a poloni sandwich with white bread, eh? I had some of you are going, absolutely no way. Poloni on white bread, not a chance. My nephew, that's what I do. I said, whenever we go down there as often as I can, I buy him a loaf of white bread with a big thing of poloni. He's so happy. Easiest guy in the world to please. 
But the fact of the matter is, what bread to you and I, well, there's so many other options, aren't there? We can eat many other different things. We don't even need bread. But bread, in this context, bread was life. Bread was life. You see, for us, the, the meaning is lost because we don't need bread. But for them, bread meant you lived. If you had bread, you lived. If you didn't have bread, well, then you died. So bread ultimately was a source of life. Many other things were just luxury. Some people just lived on water and bread, like the widow in 1 Kings 17. When Elijah comes to you, she says, I've just got a jar of flour and a small little bit of oil. I'm going to make a loaf of bread. But when that bread is done and my son and I eat it, well, then we're done. Then we're just going to die because that's all I have. Because after that, I have no more bread. And Elijah has the cheek to say to her, well, make the bread and give me the bread. She's like, what? And she does in faith. She gives her last bit of bread to Elijah. And she had enough bread and supply until the famine was over. Elijah was a, was a marker, was a foreshadow of Jesus. She had put her hope in the bread, but Elijah had said, no, lift your eyes upwards. But bread means life. And Jesus is drawing the link. And he's saying, I'll give you words. I'm going to teach you. But he gives them bread. And the link is between his words and the bread. Is my words give life. I am a source of life. The bread represented, I am the source of all life. That's what the bread represented. And he brings about life, unlike other revolutions which bring about death and decay and squashing and oppressing, because that's how revolutions come about. You take one power and another power squashes them, and then they become the oppressed. That's how the world operates, doesn't it? But the kingdom of God operates differently. The kingdom of God, the result is nobody ends up being oppressed. Because he's going to bring about a different revolution. <coughs> you see, the answer, even in our nation, is not for one political party to supersede another and then oppress them. The answer is the kingdom of God, where nobody is oppressed. And he brings about life in two ways. Number one, through his word. And number two, through deeds. That's what we are as a people. We're the people about God's word. That's what you're hearing today, is we're preaching from God's word. Allow these words to, to fill you, to bring you hope, to bring you life, to meet needs that you don't even know that you need. And somehow it's meeting things in your very inner being. The word of God is ever so powerful. And Jesus is often drawing this link between, between bread and his words. Bread representing the source of life and, and his words. In Matthew 4 he says, Man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See the link between bread and his words. Just remembering bread equals source of life. My words, the scriptures, is a source of life for you. In John 6, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. What we need to see is that the words of Jesus, the words of God, the Bible, is like bread from heaven. That's why Jesus, when he taught his disciples how to pray, he said, to the Father in heaven that he would give you your daily bread your source of life and we, we all equate that to provision financially which it is that but it's deeper than that these are eternal words even Peter would say it post the feeding of the 5,000 they all follow him again because oh, we had a nice grub there and even though he's not going to be our king and won't bow to our agenda at least we get bread and we get fed so let's go and have a few sandwiches with Jesus and a bit later they get to it but he doesn't give them the bread this time because they've all now had their full and he says actually hang on I am the bread of life I am the bread I am the source of all life and if you want to have a part of me in my kingdom and my revolution 
well then you need to eat my flesh. Can you imagine that context? They had not had the Passover yet where Jesus had broken the bread with his disciples and said, this is my body. And so many of the people who were following, they weren't getting their food, but they couldn't understand his teaching because they didn't know what it meant. And even the disciples were struggling with what he was saying, that you need to eat of my flesh. They found it a hard teaching, but Peter comes back and he says, when Jesus questioned him, so he was just struggling out. Are you, are you wanting to leave too? Because they were starting to doubt this is a bit beyond us. And Peter comes up with an absolute gem and he says, where else will we go? It's a good question to you now. Where are you going to go? If not to Jesus, where are you going to go? For you have all the words of eternal life. Nobody's given us hope like you've given us hope. We don't understand anything. I don't even know what it means to eat your flesh. But you've promised things that nobody else has promised. You've claimed things. We've seen things. You've done things. Where else are we going to go? Where are you going to go? God's put eternity in our hearts. And Jesus has the words of eternal life. John 10 verse 10 says, not just words of eternal life, but words of abundant life. I've come that they may have life and have it in abundance. The word of God is nourishing, it's cherishing, it's revealing, it's, it's powerful, it's like yeast in our bodies. And that's why when we read it in our daily devotions, even though some things we don't understand, we know that these are the words of eternal life which we're putting into our very being. And as we do that in faith, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us and it will enliven you and strengthen you. Please read the Bible and pray. Because that is how God gives life. It's like the bread of life. That is your manna from heaven. Not only does, does he give words and give us life through his word, but through deeds. You, you know, Jesus here, he, 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 he feeds them and he does a good deed, but he is a, he's a God of word and he's a God of deed. Much like the leper, he, he, when he heals the leper, just prior to that, the disciples find him praying and they say, where have you been? And he says, no, we must go preach, but we must go to the other towns, for that is why I've come to, to proclaim the, the word of God. And we all think, all oh, the word, God. So, yes, it's all about the word of God, and we give him the word. But then on the way, he stops to meet a leper, an outcast of society, and he does this incredible deed where the leper's at his feet, and he touches him, and he says, I am willing, and he completely heals him in his entirety. And the disciples say, I thought it was about the word. No, it's about word and it's about deed. It's about following the voice of my Father and doing exactly what He tells me to do whenever, wherever He tells me. And we're a people about words, but we're also a people about deed. And we don't substitute one for the other. They are both inextricably tied. God's word in us would inevitably result in us doing good deeds, like helping Levi. Why, why does God do miracles? What, what do you think the purpose of Jesus doing miracles? Doing good deeds like miracles. Why, why does he do them? Well, number one, there's a word in there, he does them because of compassion. Do you think Jesus is about just being spectacular? Just so that he can, he can get people to believe in him because they can see how powerful he is. He must be the one. Look how powerful he is. Do you think miracles are there just for the spectacular? If that were the case, why on earth bread, steak, would be better? Be way more spectacular. Steak and cake. Cook sisters. And as my friends in the cake would say, cook sisters. But why bread? I mean, bread's boring. You know, if Jesus was just about doing miracles for the spectacular, if he's going to walk on water, why not do a few flick -lacks? <laughs> Uh Really? You know, incinerate some trees. <laughs> Fireball here, there, too. 
You know, because that would really be spectacular and more wow. So if, if, if that were the case, he definitely needs a better PR agent, better marketing person. But you see, the, the, the point of miracles is not for the spectacular. The point of miracles is to reveal the redemptive purpose of God's power. I'm going to read a quote for you from, from Jürgen. I think his name is Moltmann. Is it on the screen? Yeah. Jesus' healings are the only natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and weird. That, that is quite something to get your head around. Because here's what we think as people. That's why we prayed for people today. Because we're allowing God to do what only He can do. And to bring about His natural order. We often think a miracle, or if somebody is healed, that is unnatural. That's your default thinking. Am I right, Marita? We think that they are suspensions of what is natural to us. We have been duped into thinking that everything around us, this is what's natural, and miracles are supernatural. Stretching your mind a bit? What Jürgen Moltmann is saying is that the way that God originally created things, that is natural. What we are living in is the unnatural. And God is leading it back to His natural order. And the miracles are windows and glimpses into the restorations of that natural order. Does that flip your mind in terms of how things... We've come to believe that everything around us is natural. But deep within us, deep within us, if you go outside here and you go through this week and you look at the world, is you're going to be thinking this is not normal. Something is wrong with the world. And as Jürgen Moltmann described it, it's unnatural, demonized, and the world is wounded. So the point of the miracles is to show and for us to see the redemptive purpose of Jesus' power. Miracles are not suspensions of the natural order, but rather restorations of God's natural order. We as a church, we need a belief for this. We will not bring about the kingdom. We will not change the political status of nations. We will not be the yeast and the salt unless we embrace the supernatural power of God in our lives. Unless we create moments like we did this morning to pray for people and allow God to move and do what only He can do. We are not to be a people who comes here every Sunday and follow a formula and tick the box of what we feel we need to do in a religious manner. We are to obey the voice of the Father and say, Josh, can you change the song, please? Because I feel the Holy Spirit wants to do something. Amen. And in the responsiveness of God's people, where Josh says, Josh, or hey, worship team, can we just swing it another way? We feel God is in this. We're to obey the voice and the promptings of God if we're going to see this. Amen. We're to be a church who embraces the spiritual gifts of God, that we're not a bunch of cessationists who believe that the spiritual gifts that operated in the early church do not operate for today. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and He wants to express Himself in the very same manner as He expressed Himself then. Amen. And the world needs it now more than ever. Amen. The kingdom of God to come in such a powerful way, but it's the, it's the people of God that He's going to do it in and through. In and through, not just in you, but in and, and through you. That in each and every single person in this room, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, God has given you a gift, if not one, multiple of them, and He wants to express Himself to the world in a spiritual way where people will be astounded and say, God is truly in their midst. Amen. And you might be thinking, that's beyond me, but wait till my next point.
We're going to go until the next five, just seven minutes. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God wants to express himself through the world, to the world, to you and I. He wants to create disciples. But what a disciple means is that we become more and more like him. That means we need to read the Gospels and what did Jesus say and what did he do? Even Paul, when he wrote to the Romans in Romans 15, he said, All that I said, words which bring life, the bread, the source of life, deposit, but, but that source of life, that bread, that yeast, that so everything that gets deposited into you, all that I said and did among you. And then he expounds on the did by saying the miracles and the signs and wonders that happen among you. It must be about what we said and what we did. And we need to find greater faith for the doing of God's word. For somehow I feel we've become a little bit apathetic in this area. Or maybe some of us are a little bit fearful or apprehensive of it. Much probably like the disciples were. But we're going to go there as a church because I believe that's where the power of God will move. The third thing we see here is Jesus uses unqualified people to bring about a miracle. These disciples were not qualified. Amen. In no way were they qualified. In no way was Brad qualified to pray for people today. Sorry, if you want to. Leave that alone. We're not qualified. You can imagine the disciples. The emphasis is on you feed them. <laughs> 5,000 men with appetites. How on earth are we going to feed them? I've got a quote for you. Until such time as you know that the task is impossible and that what I'm calling you to do is impossible, you are not qualified for it. I'll read you another quote. You can put that next one up. I really like this quote. It's the long one. This is regarding the church. It is not God's intention that we should be in ourselves adequate to our tasks. You're not adequate. Get over it. You're not adequate to teach children's church. You're not adequate to preach. And Terry, you're not adequate to come give a word. And Pushpa, you're also not adequate to pray out loud. Okay. But how wonderful was that? And I'm not even adequate to preach here. Trust me. Ask my wife. <laughs> Josh is not adequate to lead worship. And neither are you all adequate. So let's get over it. If we only accept the task which we think we are adapted to in our powers, we're not responding to the call of God. If you think you're adequate to overcome your issues, you're not. You need a power that is greater than you to overcome your issues. You're not adequate. Get over it. The church is always in a crisis and always will be. And so will you be, often. Because you are the church. You always have difficulties, limitations, insoluble problems, lack of people and finances. You always get a menacing look. Don't worry. Because I just said you're not adequate. You have endless misunderstandings and misrepresentations because somebody will misrepresent what I just said and somebody has just probably misunderstood me anyway. We are not only to do our work despite of these things, but they are the conditions requisite for the doing of it. Only the inadequate are adequate. Amen. Amen, yes. Isn't that kind of just liberating for you and I? That Jesus uses people who are not qualified and the inadequate to bring about the miracle. If you think you're adequate, it will never happen. So how do we bring about that supernatural element or actual fact? Let's not define it as supernatural. Let's just call it God's natural order in our midst. Do you know the one thing that will prevent you from bringing this about? Is your fear of failure. Your fear of what other people will think of you if you happen to come up here and say, hey, well, I think I've got a word for somebody in the congregation. 
Well, I've heard a word of encouragement. And we look, no, oh, that's not my space. That's not stuff for me. You know, let's leave that for Dave or Terry. Amy, God spoke to you this morning. You know, sometimes that speaking is for you, which is personal. You need to discern this. And sometimes it's not for you. Sometimes he'll speak to you and through you to unlock a problem for somebody else. It's called the word of knowledge. Where that person will know that God knows my issues. You see, but we don't do these. You know why? Because we don't feel safe. We feel we're going to be judged. Man, you've probably been sitting just for donkey's years. There's so much in you that it's not just for children to hear. You know that? Because your realm of influence doesn't just belong in the children's church. Your voice and the way that God speaks through people is so powerful. And God is wanting to express Himself again, but we've silenced the voice of the church. Because we've just left the pastors. Because they're the only credible ones with the voice. Qualified ones. Let's just get over it. I'm not qualified. I'm inadequate. You're inadequate. This is how we will start to restore God's natural order through unqualified people. Look how he does the miracle. Bring me what you got. Bring me what you got. Well, I don't have much. Two loaves and five fish, 5,000 men. It's like, oh, I'll take that away. Moses, what do you have? I just got a stick. It'll do big. That stick, I'll bring about a deliverance that you've never seen before. What do you have? Mark, what do you have? Two hands, feet, voice. There's things in you. What do you got? Bring it to me. Don't just, oh, no, I've got lots of talent. Thank you. This is the problem. I've got so much talent in charisma. I don't need you, God, because I can do it on my own. Flat. You've got to bring it to Jesus, whatever you have. Number one. And he's the one. Once you bring it to him. You notice he doesn't do the miracle like Dumbledore. You know the wizard? just, oh, bread. Big pile of bread, now go distribute it. You know what he does with the bread? He says, bring it to me. And it's as they go. It multiplies. He even gets them in faith. Imagine how silly they would have felt Yeah, Get them into groups, organize everyone, and everybody's looking at the groups and thinking, there's two loaves of bread. How is this going to work? He gets them in faith to get organized and prepared for what's about to come. He doesn't provide the tons of bread and then say, now go organize the people. He says, as you go. As they go, God just provides and he multiplies. That's how the kingdom of God is going to come about. Unqualified people, we bring them what we got and it's as we go in faith, organizing ourselves well. You know, I'm not just blind. There's order in the church. But, but it's as they go. How can he do this? Well, the key was in the bread. Those two words. He broke it. And he blessed it. The blessing only comes in the brokenness. Those two verbs, same verbs he used in Mark 14 when he met with his disciples. The Last Supper. He says, This is my body. This is my body. This blessing will come about because of my brokenness. There's a blessing that can come into your life because of his brokenness. You don't need to be qualified for it. I want to pray. We've prayed enough this morning. We can never pray enough. Sorry, Lord. <laughs> I'm qualified. But I just want to pray. There's a fear of man over people. 
I know that in this room, every single Sunday, God speaks. Because the Bible tells me so. That God speaks to every single person here. In some way or another, it can be a vision, it can be a dream, it can be an impression. You might look at the rose outside and feel God speaking to you. You have to discern, is that for me or is that for me and for somebody else? And sometimes what it might mean is just a word of encouragement for somebody outside. But that the life of God may begin to throw, flow through you, the source of the very life of God, that the manna from heaven can reach into the lives of others and bring new hope to them. The church is, is not as powerful as it should be because the body is sitting apathetic and dormant because of a fear that is governing them. Because you feel you need to be qualified, which is the lie of the devil. You don't need to be qualified to pray for somebody. You don't need to be qualified to go and edify, encourage, and exhort somebody else. You do not need to be qualified for that. You don't need to be qualified to have a voice here and not just up in children's church. This body needs to be awakened. Awake, O sleepers, says the word. Come. Father, I want to pray. Just close your eyes with me. Lord, I want to pray for courage and faith. I want to pray that we just come to terms with the fact of our inadequacy, but that is the requisite for what you call us to do, is our realization of that. It is only in you can this come about. Last thing I'm going to speak to you. Does anybody know this picture? Hector Peterson, 1976, the spark of the Soweto uprising. Every revolution begins with a shot. You know that. What's that guy, George Floyd in the States? A violent act. Most revolutions start with a violent act. All revolutions start with a violent act. This was the Soweto Uprising. That is an 18-year-old student carrying Hector Peterson who was killed on that day. That's why we celebrate Youth Day. A violent act started that uprising. But we're not a political uprising. We belong to a completely different revolution. And our revolution also started with a hideous, horrendous act of violence didn't where his body was broken on the cross and that started a revolution it started a revolution that will never end it will go on to for all eternity a deliverance from Satan's sin and death and the power of him over our lives because of that act of violence on his body that broke a revolution started that will never end and I put up that picture because of the youth. Everyone who's under 35, stand up, please. Stand. Everyone who's under 35, stand. The youth. Youth can be such a word which kind of labels us and puts us in a box, doesn't it? The youth of today, I hope for this nation, is new hands. Not a political agenda, but as you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength, you will be like you used have this incredible power to change and influence the environments you in. And everybody who's older than 35, it is your responsibility to equip them for that task. Our nation, I put the youth there because that was a youth uprising, but I want to see a youth uprising in the church. our responsibility of those who are older than to unlock that potential in them and not make them sit down. A different time. But we're going to pray for them. We're going to do that now. Will you just stretch out your hands toward them? If you need to put a hand on them. Lord, these young men and women face challenges we never faced in our day. 
their battles are different, their giants are different. But help us as a people to equip them for the task at hand. Bless them. Help them to know that even if they feel inadequate, it doesn't rest on them, it rests on you, Jesus. We give them to you today and say, Lord, bless them. Help us to fulfill the role that we have in equipping them for the task that they have for the next generation to come. May the youth come to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll close with that shot. You're going to have some tea and coffee. Good. <laughs>